directors along with Omar, Camille, and Daniel for the Global Diabetes Journal Club, or GDJC. And we're really excited to welcome Dr. Jason Torres. He's actually a colleague of mine from uh, Mark McCarthy's group back at Oxford, um, who since moved over to Genentech. Um, and Jason has continued on from his postdoc to become a senior genetic epidemiologist over at the Nuffield Department of Public Health at Oxford, just a short walk from where he was doing his postdoc. Um, and he's going to present on a recent project, uh, tissue level classification of loci associated with type two diabetes. And his background is in human genetics uh, from when he did his PhD. Um, awesome. Also, Jason wanted me to let you know to um, add your questions in the chat once the presentation starts, and then Daniel or I will highlight those questions if they're especially like pertinent in the presentation. Otherwise, we'll address them after. All right, take it away. All right. Well, well, thank you very much, Lauren, and thank you to the other organizers for the Global Diabetes Journal Club. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you all tonight. Uh, as Lauren mentioned, my name is Jason. I'm a genetic epidemiologist who's uh, interested in metabolic disease. Um, and as you can see from uh, the title slide, uh, uh, and just checking, is my, my sheen, uh, screen sharing okay? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, so, so from what you can see on the title slide, I'll be talking tonight about uh, genetic loci associated with type two diabetes uh, and my previous efforts to, to um, uh, map them to specific tissues. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this is work that was recently published in the American Journal of Human Genetics um, and stems from a longstanding interest uh, in, in type two diabetes. Uh, and diabetes is certainly um, no stranger to this audience uh, as, um, as you know, diabetes is a metabolic disease characterized by chronically elevated uh, blood glucose levels uh, resulting from um, insulin, impaired insulin signaling. Uh, and we also know that this is a disease that presents a serious public health burden. Uh, in the UK alone, uh, 4.7 million people have some form of diabetes, uh, with the vast majority being uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, this corresponds to about 8% of the adult British population. And given the central role that glucose homeostasis plays in, in human health and metabolism, uh, its dysregulation in diabetes um, results in, in many serious complications. Uh, and for that reason, diabetes is a leading uh, cause of uh, end-stage uh, kidney failure. Uh, diabetes is a, is a major cause for retinopathy, uh, as well as a number of serious vascular outcomes, um, including uh, strokes and heart attacks and heart failure. Um, now, when we look at the etiology of diabetes, um, and specifically type 2 diabetes, uh, in many ways, type 2 diabetes uh, is the poster child of a complex human disease. Uh, we know that it's influenced by uh, a myriad number of uh, environmental factors, um, foremost being a poor diet and a sedentary lifestyle. Uh, but for, for quite some time, we've also known that this is a disease that exhibits a pronounced genetic component. And over the past 20 years, we've really appreciated how complex this genetic component is. Um, and just so as a bit of background, um, the past 20 years have really benefited um, from the completion of the Human Genome Project and the introduction of a study design known as the Genome-Wide Association Study, or GWAS. Um, and for those who aren't familiar with the GWAS, uh, th these are large association tests where you have a, a, a cohort of unrelated uh, control individuals and unrelated uh, case individuals, uh, in this case, type two diabetics, um, that are then genotyped uh, using SNP arrays um, that measure markers, uh, tens of thousands to hundreds of, of, of thousands of markers throughout the entire genome. Uh, and and the, the genetic markers often used are um, what are called SNPs or, or single nucleotide polymorphisms. And so in the, the center of, of this figure here on the bottom uh, is a cartoon where you have, what's, um, you have a SNP uh, which again is a single base pair change uh, where one individual has the A allele uh, at a given site and the other individual has the G allele. Um, and these are, 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 um, are, are polymorphisms that again vary across individuals. Um, and in a GWAS, we try to map, we aim to map these, these SNPs that associate uh, with increased diabetes risk. Uh, and typically results are, are shown in what's known as a Manhattan plot uh, shown on the right. Uh, where each point corresponds to one of these SNP markers. Uh, the x-axis corresponds to physical positions on each of the 22 autosomal chromosomes. Uh, 
and the y-axis corresponds to negative log of the p-value. So the more associated a given SNP is with, uh, let's say, diabetes risk, the higher it'll be on the plot. Uh, and for some, some uh, traits and diseases, um, th these plots tend to look like a, a city skyline, hence the term Manhattan plot. Um, you know, in some traits, uh, you may just find one locus that's really strong and it looks more like Dubai, um, but you do see these characteristic um, patterns that reflect uh, both the number of associated signals as well as the, the strength of, of associated signals. Now, when we look at the past two decades of genetic discovery for type 2 diabetes, um, with each, uh, you know, with, with, with um, progressive years and with ever expanding sample sizes, mostly from GWAS studies, there have been a, a marked increase in the number of loci associated with type 2 diabetes, uh, which we can see uh, graphically represented here. Um, and this has culminated in the discovery of over 250 regions of the genome, i.e. loci, uh, that harbor uh, associ associations um, for um, type 2 diabetes risk. Um, and in fact, at these 250 regions, there are over 400 independently associated SNPs that increase disease risk. Um, I'll point out that this is work uh, led by my, my um, colleague, uh, Dr. Nuba Mahajan. Uh, this was a Herculean effort to meta-analyze 32 European GWASs, uh, representing nearly 900,000 individuals and 10 million markers. Um, and, and last year, in an effort to outdo herself, uh, Dr. Mahajan and colleagues um, performed a trans-ethnic meta-analysis of 1.3 million individuals uh, from five um, uh, global superpopulations. Um, and again, we see that there are hundreds of loci um, that uh, contribute to disease risk. Um, and the fact that there are so many loci uh, relevant to type 2 diabetes um, is, is why type 2 diabetes is referred to as a polygenic trait, meaning many loci, uh, which we can see this is quite the skyline. Um, now, one of the other uh, important um, takeaways that we've gleaned from these GWAS studies is the fact that the vast majority of associated variants actually don't map to genes at all. They're, um, they're, they're non-coding SNPs. In other words, you know, instead of mapping to the 2% of the genome that, uh, that, that harbors genes that encode proteins, these are the non-coding regions that are either the introns uh, within genes or intergenic regions. Um, and the fact that these variants are non-coding uh, presents some challenges in interpreting what the biological mechanisms are by which these variants actually increase risk for diabetes. Um, now, over the past 10 years or so, there's been quite a bit of, of, of work to, to show that um, there is likely a, a role in regulating gene expression for these uh, variants. So, so rather than affecting protein structure or function, uh, these variants likely are altering uh, expression levels. Um, and this work is largely based on a, a class of variant known as an EQTL or an expression quantitative trait loci or locus. Um, and, and this is a cartoon that, that, that shows um, how an EQTL relates to gene expression. So, so in this example, the A allele at a SNP uh, associates with uh, greater levels of gene expression, uh, such that the GG uh, homozygous genotype on, on the far left, uh, individuals with this genotype uh, show overall lower expression than individuals that have uh, the homozygous genotype for the A allele uh, with higher expression. Um, and this is relevant to, to not only diabetes, but also complex traits in that if we look at the set of the most um, significantly uh, associated EQTLs, uh, we see that they are overrepresented for variants that associate uh, with a range of complex traits and diseases, including type two diabetes uh, and vice versa, that among the set of, of type two diabetes associated variants, there is an enrichment uh, for these uh, regulatory variants that impact gene expression. Um, and, Given that most of these associated variants are non-coding, uh, and presumably they have some effect on, on a gene, there's a ton of work ongoing to try to resolve what the most relevant genes are, um, sometimes referred to as the causal genes or the effector transcripts, um, which again is the, the, the transcribed you know, genes that um, uh, go on to have some effect in the cell. And and again, there's a very diverse amount of research uh, to try to resolve what the actual causal genes are uh, with respect to type 2 diabetes. Uh, 
Um, and some of these methods are based on EQTLs, as I um, introduced in the previous slide. Um, th there are formal statistical tests uh, to accomplish what's known as EQTL um, uh, co-localization. So for example, if you have a, um, I should let Henry in actually, uh, can I let Henry in? Okay. Um, so, so if you have, let's say, uh, an EQTL that associates with gene expression uh, and a uh, variant that associates with uh, type 2 diabetes uh, and a co-localization analysis, um, we would try to determine to what extent the GWAS signal and the EQTL signal are one and the same, uh, i.e. the um, variant that uh, increases gene expression or the variant that increases disease risk um, is doing so through its effect on gene expression. Um, but there are, of course, other methods um, that are uh, experimental, for example, uh, functional genetic screens um, that uh, alter uh, gene expression and, and, and gauge some relevant uh, readout. For example, this figure is, is from a, a study where the researchers used uh, short interfering RNAs to knock down the expression of candidate genes at diabetes loci. Um, to assess their effect on um, glucose-stimulated insulin secretion in a pancreatic beta cell line. Um, another line of research that uh, I think is actually really interesting is based on mapping three-dimensional chromatin interactions. Um, uh, there was a, an influential study in, in 2014 uh, where the researchers evaluated the FTO locus uh, that harbors the strongest association for obesity, um, wherein they found that the non-coding intron of FTO that's associated with obesity physically interacts uh, with the promoter of a different gene in three-dimensional space, um, uh, where that gene was shown in mice uh, when perturbed to affect body weight um, uh, accumulation. So again, these are all different methods that, that researchers um, currently use to try to resolve causal genes at these non-coding loci. But an intimately related problem um, that sometimes isn't um, uh, overtly addressed, um, but is certainly not trivial and important, is the fact that for uh, a given locus, we're often unsure about what's the most relevant cell or tissue uh, by which that signal uh, mediates its effect on diabetes risk. And this is definitely not trivial when we consider a, a complex trait like type 2 diabetes. Uh, where we know that there are multiple tissues that play a role in systemic hyperglycemia. Uh, and arguably the foremost um, consequential um, would include uh, the pancreas, uh, which of course harbors the, the beta cells that produce insulin. And in the context of type 2 diabetes, um, uh, exhibit decreased insulin secretion contributing to uh, hyperglycemia. Uh, but there's of course insulin resistance in peripheral tissues such as the skeletal muscle, uh, adipose and liver uh, where different processes in these tissues contribute to hyperglycemia uh, such as increased uh, lipolysis and adipose uh, as well as increased uh, hepatic glucose production uh, in the liver. Um, so again, th there are multiple tissues that, that are relevant and Previous studies have shown that when we study um, uh, regulatory features in these tissues, uh, that they do have a contribution to the overall risk uh, for, for complex traits such as type 2 diabetes. Um, so to give you one example, um, this, uh, th these figures come from a study in 2014 uh, where Pasquale and al. Uh, et al. mapped regulatory features in uh, pancreatic islets um, where they measured um, a number of molecular assays uh, shown here on the left. Uh, so FairSeq, for example, is accessible chromatin. Uh, these H3Ks are, are histone marks, which I'll talk about uh, a bit more briefly. Um, and, and CTCF, which is this um, uh, the structural protein that binds to DNA. Um, and by uh, clustering um, the genome using these input features, they were able to delineate uh, regulatory elements that have different functions. So, so for example, uh, uh, promoters uh, are, are regions at the uh, initiation start, uh, sites of genes involved in, in transcription. Um, uh, there are also enhancer regions, which are regulatory elements that enhance the expression of target genes. Um, and what they found, if we look at the far right, is that among SNPs that are associated with fasting glucose levels, uh, there is an enrichment for uh, regulatory enhancers mapped in islet tissue, uh, which makes sense given uh, what we know about uh, insulin secretion and, and the biology there. Uh, 
Um, but we also see that uh, among SNPs associated with type 2 diabetes, uh, there is an enrichment um, for these uh, regulatory enhancers in, um, in, in islet. Um, so, so we see an enrichment in type 2 diabetes, um, although it's not as pronounced as for fasting glucose, uh, but other studies have shown evidence that regulatory elements in liver, adipose, muscle also contribute to, to the overall um, disease risk. Um, but again, the, um, the, the key question uh, uh, we sought to address in this study is that for any given diabetes-associated um, uh, locus and associated SNP, uh, what is the most likely tissue of action? Uh, in other words, what, you know, is this variant acting through the liver and affecting some gene there, or is it acting in the pancreas and having some, some consequence in that tissue? So, um, so, so, so really, the, the, it came down to trying to find out what's going on at any given locus. So if we take a step back and think, if we were to go about trying to assign a genetic signal uh, to a tissue, um, which again is important in a number of ways. It can help us find the relevant gene and maybe that gene encodes a, a potential drug target um, that we could explore through other studies. Um, uh, there are other applications, but, but if we just wanted to know um, for a given signal, what's the most relevant tissue, you know, how would we go about doing that? Um, what type of information would we consider? Um, so, so I had a good long think about this. Um, and given that we're, we're starting with the uh, genetic data, um, that seemed to be a good place to, 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 to work from. So we can go back to the GWAS and at a given locus, uh, we can see what is the SNP that has the strongest association uh, with type two diabetes and, and you know, work from there. Uh, but in human genetics, there is a phenomenon uh, known as linkage disequilibrium. Uh, which uh, essentially refers to the fact that, that many uh, genetic variants are correlated with each other uh, due to a number of, of, of functions or number of, of, of processes. Um, and one of the consequences of this linkage disequilibrium is that in a GWAS at a given locus, the, the SNP that's the most strongly associated with disease risk isn't necessarily the causal SNP. Um, i.e. It, it may not be the SNP that's actually increasing disease risk, um, but rather simply correlated with it. Um, and because of that, uh, researchers often perform um, what's known as a fine mapping analysis, uh, an analysis to try to deduce at a given uh, disease associated locus, what is the most likely causal gene. Uh, now, there are a number of um, of approaches to do genetic fine mapping. Uh, some leverage differences in, in leakage disequilibrium across different ancestry groups. Um, some use machine learning methods, um, but, uh, but uh, one of the most widely used methods uh, I would say is based on approximate Bayesian analysis. Uh, and in the Mahajan paper that I cited previously, uh, where I was uh, one of the authors, um, after uh, Dr. Anuba Mahajan did the uh, initial GWAS association testing, we performed a, a number of fine mapping analyses, uh, including um, uh, the determination of what are known as genetic credible sets. Um, so just to get some, some intuition for this, uh, imagine a, a locus that's associated with uh, a disease. Uh, you have your, your SNP that has the highest association with it, but you also have a set of SNPs that are correlated with that. Um, and will also have some association value. Um, what you can then do is for this set of SNPs, um, calculate uh, what's known as a posterior probability of association uh, for each of them or a PPA value. Uh, so these are measures that gauge uh, the evidence that any one of those SNPs is the causal SNP. At that locus, you can then take these SNPs, rank them by these PPA values, and then retain, um, you know, keep the number of SNPs needed to achieve a cumulative PPA value uh, of some number. Uh, if you use 0.99, um, then the number of SNPs that you keep are going to be the 99% genetic credible set. Um, 
And so within this genetic credible set, you have a set of credible variants, each of which has a posterior probability of association. Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm, 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 I'm attacking you with a lot of syllables here. Um, and, and, you know, it's maybe getting a bit down the rabbit hole if you're not too familiar with this. Um, but, but basically, uh, fine mapping is a way to, to gauge our confidence in knowing what the causal SNP actually is at any given locus. Um, and we applied this method to a set of 380 um, uh, signals from, from the GWAS study. And, and the important thing to, to point out here is that these credible sets actually do vary uh, in their fine mapping resolution. So on the far left in that, um, that kind of bottom uh, figure, uh, we found that there were 18 um, signals, um, i.e. genetic associations, that we fine mapped to a single SNP. In other words, these are, 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 are associations where we think we know what the causal variant is uh, with a very high confidence. On the other hand, if you look to the right, there are 176 signals that were fine mapped to more than 51 SNPs, where you know, we have 51 plus candidates. Um, so we have much less confidence in knowing what the causal variant is. Um, and so rather than focusing on the, the top SNP at any given locus, um, we consider these genetic credible sets um, as they do reflect our, our relative certainty uh, in knowing what the causal variant is. All right, so that's one, right? So genetic information, genetic fine mapping is, is kind of the, the first point. Um, but again, this question is all about trying to resolve what we think the most relevant tissues are at any given locus. Um, and so the next bit of information we considered uh, in terms of data that varies across tissue um, is of course gene expression. Uh, we know that you know, there are some genes that are expressed uh, in, in many tissues, and we know that there are genes that are expressed in only a subset of tissues. Uh, so for example, on the left, we have the expression profile for a housekeeping gene known as ATF1, uh, which we can see here in the GTEx project is expressed uh, uh, you know, uh, variably across a set of uh, 50 plus tissues. Um, but on the right, we have insulin, which as we would expect is only expressed in the pancreas um, and specifically the beta cells. Um, so we do see that there is this variable level of expression where some genes are, are more tissue specific than others. Um, so, so one measure we considered is, is this term known as expression specificity scores. Uh, so for a given gene in a given tissue, uh, you could take the median expression of that gene in a tissue uh, and divided by the sum of the median expression of that gene across a set of tissues. Uh, this gives you a value between zero and one, where one indicates um, that uh, the gene is specifically expressed in a given tissue. Um, so, so this is the second bit of information we considered were these uh, expression specificity scores. Now, what else could we look at? Uh, what other data type um, varies across cell and tissues? Um, well, there's actually a lot, um, and, and there's a lot of data that comes from the you know, molecular epigenetics. Um, so, so there are these molecular uh, features that do differ across um, cells and tissues. Uh, so you know, you're know you probably familiar with DNA methylation. Uh, there, there are differences in DNA methylation patterns across cells. Um, there are differences in patterns of accessible chromatin. Uh, so you can use assays like DNA's hypersensitivity or attack seq um, but they uh, I essentially identify regions that are uh, more open and uh, more likely to be involved in, in active gene regulation. Um, and there are also um, histone modifications. Uh, so you, you may recall histones are structural proteins that DNA physically wraps around uh, within the nuclei of cells. And these histones are comprised of subunits that have these uh, peptide tails that can be modified by specific chemicals. And these chemical modifications associate with different um, functions. Um, and so there could be an addition of a methyl group uh, on a certain amino acid or the addition of an acetyl group um, that can have effect on, on, on certain activity within, within DNA. Um, and so like when, when you look at this data, it can actually be very daunting uh, to, to make sense of it because there, there's so many different types of, of, of molecular features. Um, but fortunately, there have been uh, you know, a lot of work in this area where people have done some pretty sophisticated um, analysis look, using machine learning uh, to take as input a bunch of these molecular features and learn um, certain chromatin states that they could assign to, to cells. Uh, so for example, um, this, um, 
the, 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 this is what you call a chromatin state map um, that, 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 that is shown for, for six cell types from the ENCODE project. And you can see that each, each row corresponds to a different cell in the body. Um, and within, um, if, if you go across physical positions on, on the chromatin, uh, you see that they're different colors. Uh, and these colors uh, correspond to different activities. Uh, so the red regions would be promoter regions uh, at the initiation sites of genes involved in transcription. Um, and the yellow regions, on the other hand, would be enhancer regions that associate with increased uh, gene expression activity. Um, and you can see that this does differ you know, across cell types. Um, and each of these chromatin states um, corresponds to a different set of molecular features. Uh, so, so this uh, figure on the bottom of the slide um, comes from a chromatin state analysis performed by Stephen Parker's group uh, at the University of Michigan, uh, where they performed chromatin segmentation analysis on, on 30 cell and tissue types uh, and identified 18 chromatin states uh, where we can just see they have different um, properties. Uh, so for example, the, the chromatin state one, the, 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 the bright red um, uh, uh, state uh, is what they call active transcription start site. Um, it has this, uh, this, this mark uh, for H3K27 acetylation. So that's uh, an acetyl group on lysine number 27 on histone subunit three. Um, and, and there's also this H3K4 trimethylation mark, um, uh, which is associated with promoter activity. So, um, so basically these chromatin states are a nice way of summarizing um, uh, quite a lot of information into these, these um, more intuitive um, uh, functional states. All right, <laughs> uh, question. Yeah, Jason, if I could ask um, and kind of try to summarize all the information on this slide, so many complex levels of information. So um, am I understanding it right that, um, so DNA methylation and acetylation are ways to alter expression levels of various parts of the genome. Um, that would be coding. And then histones are basically DNA wrapped around protein and like to different degrees of tightness, DNA can be wrapped and that also affects expression levels. And so what's expressed in these chromatin state maps and in this grid below is kind of looking at, um, I guess, how amplified or how, um, how not different parts of the genome are uh, across tissues. Yeah, essentially, you know, th th that's it. Where you have these different um, molecular features that have been independently as shown, uh, associated with different functional states. So, uh, if you just think about DNA methylation, regions that have uh, a greater level of DNA methylation are typically associated with lower levels of of expression and activity, whereas more accessible chromatin regions have, you know, uh, you know, more, more likely to be involved in, in gene regulation. Um, and there are um, dozens of histone modifications that have been associated with different um, uh, levels of activity. Um, mm -hmm. and, and what the chromatin state analysis does is input, um, you know, takes as input a set of these features uh, and, 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 and condenses them into these, these active states um, that um, uh, have certain functions um, in, in DNA. So, so yeah, I think that would be the key uh, takeaway. All right, um, thanks. All right, so, so the three ingredients now are, are genetic fine mapping, uh, expression specificity scores, and chromatin states. So with the, these data sets in mind, um, uh, you know, we developed this integrative approach that uh, sought to combine this data in, 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 in one synchronous way, so, um, or systematic way. Uh, so you have uh, your GWAS Manhattan plot, um, and you have, let's say, a given region that's associated with type 2 diabetes. Uh, what we then did is fine map that region, uh, obtaining these genetic credible sets. So in this example here, we have our, 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 our GWAS peak uh, that's been fine mapped to a set of five uh, credible SNPs within the credible set. Um, so you can see that there are five SNPs um, and each has a posterior probability of association, uh, which is again, a measure of um, the evidence that any given SNP is causal here. Uh, and so of these five SNPs, the third SNP has the highest evidence of being causal, um, but, but there are five in the credible set. Um, what I then do is for each SNP in the credible set, I will map it uh, to a, a set of chromatin states uh, shown kind of in the top of the middle column here. 
Um, and so, uh, you know, each row corresponds to a different tissue. So we have islet, adipose, muscle, and liver, uh, which were those four um, uh, relevant type 2 diabetes uh, related tissues. Um, and you can see that the SNP maps to a yellow region in islet, uh, which would be an enhancer chromatin state. Uh, it maps to a red region in adipose and muscle, which are these promoter chromatin states. Uh, and it maps to a gray region in liver, which is a repressed region that's not active uh, in this cell type. Um, and so what I can do is, is encode this SNP mapping into a set of annotation vectors. Um, so, you know, the SNP that maps to the yellow region in islet, um, which is an enhancer, if we look at that, uh, that, that middle vector uh, that says enhancer, uh, there's a one under the islet and zero for everything else. Uh, annotations. Um, I mentioned that most of these associations are non-coding, um, but there are a few coding SNPs as well. Uh, and so for the few SNPs that are coding, uh, because it's coding, we could link it directly to a gene because we can see which gene it maps to. Um, and for those genes, I could look at the expression specificity scores. And so if we have a coding SNP that maps to a gene that is more highly expressed in adipose, um, I could use that information to increase the evidence that it's an adipose signal. Um, so that's what's shown on the bottom here, is that you can use the expression specificity scores to, to gauge the tissue contributions there. Um, so once I map each of these credible, uh, each credible SNP to a, a set of annotations, uh, I can then linearly combine these annotation vectors, scale them, and use them to partition the PPA value for that SNP. So a given SNP will have a, a PPA value that I then divide um, into a value for each of the tissues. Um, I do this for each SNP, um, but then I do this, you know, but then across each SNPs, I add up these values such that I get uh, one set of tissue scores for each um, genetic signal, uh, if that makes sense. Um, so for each, so this entire credible set of five SNPs um, will be combined and will result in a set of, of tissue of action scores. So on the bottom right, um, you have this kind of colorful matrix where each row is a um, genetic signal and each column is the tissue score for that signal. And so you may find that there are some signals that have more evidence of being involved in islet, uh, whereas there could be some signals with more evidence of being involved in, in muscle and liver. Um, and so uh, something else I'll just point out real quickly, um, as I somewhat alluded to before, is that different tissue annotations have different levels of, of enrichment um, for, for, for trait associated SNPs. Um, so for example, uh, the uh, chromatin state nine in islets, uh, which is an enhancer, uh, a strong enhancer shows the highest enrichment for type two diabetes associated SNPs uh, compared to a uh, weakly transcribed uh, chromatin state in islet. Um, so as an additional bit of information, I take advantage of these uh, enrichment values to uh, weigh the uh, annotations when I combine them. Okay, so um, I, know, I know I'm probably giving a lot of information here, but uh, we have, again, the genetic fine mapping, the gene expression information, the chromatin states, and these enrichments. I then combine them and I apply this approach to uh, these genetic signals for type 2 diabetes. And in this slide here, uh, I show the top 20 genetic signals ranked for each of these tissue scores. And so on the far left, we have the top 20 signals that have the most islet evidence. Um, and then we have the muscle column, uh, an adipose column, a liver column, um, and then uh, an unclassified column. Um, and these correspond to signals where the, the credible SNPs did not map to uh, active regulatory annotations in, in either of those four other tissues. Um, and if we just take a, you know, just a broad look, um, you can see that there are some signals here that, um, you know, largely seem to be um, implicating a single tissue of action. Uh, so if you look at islet, there, there are quite a lot of signals that are just dominated by, by islet. Um, and this would include, uh, for example, SLC30A8, uh, which encodes a zinc transporter that plays in a, a role in insulin secretion in, in beta cells. Um, in adipose, you see two signals at the PPAR gamma locus. Um, PPAR gamma um, encodes uh, a, a transcription factor, um, yeah, transcription factor, um, no, a, a receptor um, that um, uh, is the target for a class of insulin sensitizing drugs known as thiazolidine dions um, that act on peripheral tissues. Um, 
So, so you can see that there are some signals that have a, a dominant contribution from a given tissue, um, but you also see that there, there are signals that have contributions from two or more tissues. Uh, and this is definitely the case in the muscle column, uh, where you see that uh, among uh, the signals that have more muscle contribution, you also see contributions from, from other tissues. Um, and so this seemingly indicates that there are some sharing going on, that you have some signals that maybe have effects on two or more tissues. Um, and so this could result from the case where you have a causal SNP that is mapping to a regulatory element with effects on, on, on two or more tissues. Um, but it may also affect or reflect the fact that, um, you know, we're dealing with a signal that's just not really well fine mapped, that maybe you have a ton of SNPs in the credible set, uh, where some of them are mapping to islet features and some of them are mapping to adipose features. And the net effect is that you get the shared uh, contribution. So we were actually worried about this. Um, and so we, we explored this more thoroughly. Um, and this has got to be the most complicated figure I've ever created uh, in this next slide. So this is uh, what you would call a scatter pie plot, um, where each point here is, is a little pie chart corresponding to a genetic signal. Um, and the x-axis corresponds to uh, the number of credible SNPs in, in the signal. Uh, so the more to the right, the, the, the more poorly fine mapped the signal is. Um, and on the, the, the left, uh, on the y-axis, uh, we have the log base two of this um, value uh, based on the sum of squared distance between TOA scores. Um, and, and basically, this is a measure of how tissue specific a signal is. So the higher a point is uh, on the y-axis, the more tissue specific. Um, now, when I regress um, uh, this, this measure of tissue specificity on fine mapping resolution, uh, only 4% of, of the variance is actually accounted for um, by, by fine mapping. Um, in other words, fine mapping resolution doesn't really be, uh, doesn't really explain uh, this sharing phenomenon. Um, and in fact, if we kind of walk through this, this, this slide a bit more um, carefully, um, at the top, we have a set of tissue specific signals, right? That are either liver signals or islet signals. Um, and we can even see that among these tissue specific signals, there are some that are, are more or less fine mapped. Um, uh, on the other side, on the other hand, we have a, a set of signals that were fine mapped to a single SNP, uh, hence why they're on the far left, um, that have contributions in two or more tissues. Um, so there are eight signals in this category. Um, and if we extend further, there are 33 additional signals that have uh, a maximum PPA value uh, greater than 0.5 um, in other words, these are signals where a single SNP explains most of the evidence of being causal. Um, and even with this signals, we do see a contribution from, from more tissues. Um, so, so this suggests that there is this, there's some level of tissue sharing going on uh, at, at genetic loci. Um, so this is all well and good. Uh, what we then did is, is uh, applied these, these tissue scores uh, into a simple rule-based classifier uh, where um, we, we assign a, a signal to a tissue um, if for that signal it has a TOA score greater than some um, uh, minimum threshold and is the maximum value. Um, and so uh, on the left plot, uh, we see that there are four thresholds. So two permissive thresholds of, of zero and 0.2 uh, and, and two stringent thresholds of, of 0.5 and 0.8 uh, where the more stringent um, the, the threshold, the, uh, the fewer signals are classified. Um, if we take, um, uh, uh, and also based on the previous slide where there seemed to be some sharing, um, we also included a sharing uh, designation where uh, a signal was classified as being shared if um, it had two or more tissue scores that were exceeding the threshold and within a range of 0.1. Um, and on the right, uh, I show results from a PCA analysis um, where you can see that there are discrete clusters uh, of, of, of genetic signals that, that correspond to different tissues. So you have this green cluster um, kind of in the middle that corresponds to islets, um, islet variants. Uh, then you have on the top right, a yellow cluster corresponding to, to adipose signals, uh, a, a liver cluster on the bottom. Um, and in fact, uh, the primary axis of variation distinguishes islet signals uh, from signals mapping to insulin responsive peripheral tissues. Um, which, which does track, I think, with the physiology uh, of type 2 diabetes. Um, 
But we also see that there are quite a lot of signals that are shared that kind of map in between uh, the, these blue points, um, including some that are equidistant. Um, so for example, if we look between islet and uh, liver, uh, you see this, this blue signal prox1, uh, which has uh, comparable contributions from both of these tissues. And overall, um, most of the signals that were classified uh, were classified as being shared. Um, so this is all well and good. And um, how much time do I, do I have, uh, Lauren, just to, because uh, I, I notice I'm already 40 minutes in. It's all right. Um, we can take like 10 minutes of questions or so. So um, maybe like eight or so more minutes. Okay, I can, I can do that. All right, so, um, so, so we've classified these signals. Um, and that's 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 fine, but um, you know, it, it, is this actually meaningful, or is this just kind of nonsense? Um, and so, most of the work actually we did on this project was trying to convince ourselves that uh, the signals that we classified um, were actually uh, relevant um, and informing uh, tissues of action. Um, and so, we did a series of of um, a validation analysis, and and I. I won't go through them all today, um, but one set of analysis were based on EQTLs. So again, if you remember earlier in the talk, I talked about these variants that associate with gene expression. Um, and, and one question we asked is that among the signals that we classify as a given tissue, uh, to what extent are they supported by um, enrichment of tissue specific EQTLs uh, for that tissue? Um, so again, this is another uh, monster of a, of a figure, um, but just, just to, to parse through this a bit more um, uh, carefully, um, if you look at this cell here with the, the red border, um, this column corresponds to signals that we classified as islet, um, pancreatic islet. Uh, and the x-axis corresponds to those four thresholds uh, in our classifier. Um, so again, the more stringent the threshold, uh, the fewer signals uh, were classified uh, to islet. Each row corresponds to a set of tissue-specific EQTLs. Uh, and the Y axis corresponds to the fold enrichment. And what we can see in this cell is that as we use a more stringent threshold for assigning um, uh, uh, signals to islet, uh, we see a, a a significant and specific enrichment for islet EQTLs uh, that we don't see in, in the signals classified as muscle, adipose, or liver. Uh, similarly, uh, among the signals that we classify as uh, liver signals, we see that there is a um, specific enrichment for, for liver EQTLs uh, that we don't see in the other uh, three key tissues. Um, now, there were fewer signals classified to adipose and, and muscle uh, so we don't really see too many significant um, results there. Uh, but where we do see significance in adipose, um, uh, the most significant enrichment corresponds to adipose-specific EQTLs. Um, and again, the key thing is that we did not use EQTLs in the classifier. So, so these would be independent data um, that, that does seem to support uh, this tissue-specific uh, um, uh, quality of the classifier. Now. Uh, uh, another line of evidence that, um, uh, that, that is relevant is that um, in parallel with, with this effort to, to classify signals based on, on, on tissue information, um, uh, researchers, including uh, Dr. Mahajan, um, have been also trying to have, have also clustered signals uh, based on uh, associations for related traits. Um, so in this figure here, there are 94 um, signals associated with type 2 diabetes. Um, what Anuba did is, is took these 94 uh, diabetes signals um, and uh, referenced uh, their associations uh, with a number of other traits, uh, anthropometric traits, glycemic traits, lipid traits, uh, and clustered them based on these physiological profiles. So for example, this blue uh, corner on, on the right um, are a set of diabetes-associated variants um, that uh, implicate an effect on insulin secretion in that they uh, associate with lower levels of fasting insulin, um, lower levels of HOMA B, um, and higher levels of, of pro-insulin. Uh, whereas this green cluster in the middle, this triangle, um, are, are diabetes-associated variants that also associate with higher BMI uh, and a higher waist-to-hip ratio, um, and hence are, are implicated in adiposity. 
Um, and given that these physiological processes happen in tissues, um, I, I did a number of analysis to see to what extent um, the tissue assigned signals are concordant with these physiological uh, 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 clustering. Uh, and so what we can see is that among the signals that uh, I classify as islet signals, uh, we see an enrichment um, for signals that are implicated in insulin secretion, uh, which makes sense given that insulin is secreted in islets. Uh, whereas uh, among signals that we classify as adipose, um, there is an enrichment for um, uh, signals clustered uh, as being uh, insulin action um, signals in peripheral tissues. Um, and uh, in, in, encouragingly on the bottom, uh, there was a, a separate analysis that aimed to physiologically cluster uh, diabetes signals uh, using uh, somewhat different data and a different uh, algorithm. Um, and even then we can see that uh, signals that we um, classify as islet um, are enriched for signals that in that other study were implicated in beta cell physiology. Um, so broadly, uh, th this, this, um, this line of um, analysis supports our tissue classification. Um, so the last result I'll share with you today is, okay, we, we have this approach. We can um, use it in a classifier that seems to be supported by uh, independent data. Um, what can we learn with this? Um, well, as I mentioned like very early in the talk, there are, are 250 loci associated with type 2 diabetes, uh, but 403 uh, independent SNPs, um, which means that you know there, there are a lot of there, there are many loci um, where you have uh, two or more independent associations, um, and this is a form of allelic heterogeneity. Uh, what we asked is for these signals or for these loci where you have multiple signals. Um, to what extent do they involve the same tissues or different tissues? Um, and there were certainly loci where we had independent signals um, with, with comparable uh, tissue profiles. Uh, so for example, MTNR1B kind of in the middle there um, has two signals, both of which have a strong islet score. Um, so there seems to be two independent um, risk alleles at this uh, locus, both of which seem to be uh, suggesting an effect in islet. On the other hand, um, you have a set of, of signals um, or, or loci with, with disparate uh, tissue profiles. Um, and if you look on maybe just the far right on the bottom, there's HNF1 beta, which is a, a transcription factor um, implicated in forms of monogenic diabetes of the young. Uh, that is a transcription factor involved in um, development of both pancreas and, and liver. And we can see that there, there are three independent signals here. One has a, a stronger profile in islet, uh, another in liver, and the one in the between has kind of an equal contribution from both, uh, which may suggest heterogeneous effects on, in tissues. Um, what we think is particularly interesting is right there in the middle is TCF7L2, um, which at least in Europeans uh, is the locus that has the strongest association with type two diabetes. Um, but within this locus, there are five, or, or actually seven independent um, signals. Uh, the lead signal um, has a contribution, or has contributions from both islet and liver. I'm sorry, um, ad, islet and, and adipose, um, and that's also the case for um, uh, for four uh, uh, other signals as well. So five of the seven have uh, suggestive evidence for for those two tissues. Uh, whereas you can see there are two signals here that have um, more of a liver contribution, um, and and there are numerous studies that implicate TCF702 with um, relevant effects in in liver islet and adipose. Um, uh, and this is currently an ongoing line of, of research. Um, so uh, there, there are a number of limitations with this approach. Um, maybe a key one I'll flag is that, you know, this, this doesn't actually tell us what the causal genes are. Um, but in the paper, we do show how you can couple these tissue scores uh, with um, EQTL colocalization to further refine sets of candidate genes um, that are supported by uh, experimental evidence. Um, and to summarize, um, uh, you know, this is a method for integrating across different data types to assign uh, signals to tissue of action. Uh, we can um, uh, develop a classifier that's supported by orthogonal data. Um, and uh, we, we do believe that this approach will, will get better as uh, we develop um, uh, higher resolution data. Um, for example, better fine mapping um, and, and more tissue specific um, annotations. Um, and so this is implemented in an in a, in a R package uh, 
called tactical, uh, which is short for tissue of action scores for investigating complex trait associated loci. So it just rolls off the tongue. Um, and if you're interested in playing with it, uh, by all means, feel free to, to, to give it a go. Um, many people to thank, but, but namely um, Dr. Nuba Mahajan, who's been a wonderful colleague, uh, along with professors Anna Gloin and Mark McCarthy. Um, and with that said, thank you so much for your time and, and your attention, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks, Jason. So um, everybody, feel free to add your thoughts in the chat, add questions, or just unmute yourself. Um, and we'll go ahead with some questions. Yeah, okay. Maybe, maybe I can get to start off the questions, Jason. Like, first of all, like really great talk. You think you did a really nice job just explaining all these concepts and and terms. And there's like a lot of things to to uh, yeah to know here. Um, one of the things I thought about was just, so what was one of, one of the most like interesting findings or things that popped up in your, in your analysis here? Like there's so many, like so much information, right? It's almost like an overload because you have so many genes that map to so many different things and, and all that. But uh, what are a few things that kind of popped out where you were like, that's really, really interesting. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's definitely a, kind of a, a, a deluge of data. Um, and, and much of the, the work in this field right now is, is to just try to make sense of this and to come up with, with kind of simple, intuitive ways of, of parsing through all this information. Um, you know, and, and just the genetic architecture itself is, is, is complex, um, where you do have hundreds of associations, uh, most of which are non-coding. Um, and, and there's uh, so much uh, work going on right now to try to make sense of this and, and try to say, okay, well, you know, what, you know, what's going on at this region? You know, what's the target gene? Um, you know, is this happening in a particular tissue, a set of tissues? Is this something relevant um, during development or is this something that gets relevant later in life? Um, and so, so actually, yeah, m much of the, I think the real challenges are just trying to come up with um, principal ways of, of integrating across these different data types. Um, to, to kind of piece together, you know, um, you know, fill in the puzzle of what's actually going on. Um, but, but yeah, it, it can be actually a bit overwhelming uh, to, to parse through all this. Can I? Okay. Hi. Thank you, Jason, for the very nice presentation. Uh, yeah, I must confess I was a little lost because I think I've forgotten a lot about my genetics and then right now I'm a little bit too clinical, clinical. So my, my simple question is, <clears throat> is there any clinical translation in this or can we hope for anything in the nearest future? Really good question. Um, so, so I would say there, there are two lines for which uh, efforts like this uh, may eventually have some clinical utility. Um, so of course there, you know, there, there's, there's a ton of efforts to, to leverage genetic information to inform uh, putative drug or candidate drug targets. Um, we know from, from um, clinical trials that um, uh, among you know, drugs that successfully make it through um, phase two clinical trials, um, you know, they, they are more likely to have targets supported by human genetics evidence. Um, and so by working out what we think the, the to target genes are at these non-coding loci um, that, that uh, can help investigators get a better sense of what may be um, viable drug targets um, that, that may be successful. So, so that's one clinical aspect. Um, but, um, but over the past few years, there's also been uh, a lot more focus on prediction. Um, and there, there are these genetic scores called polygenic risk scores, uh, which take um, results from GWAS. Uh, so let's say you know the, the 400 associated variants, uh, and then you could take the DNA from a given uh, individual, um, genotype them, and then work out what their polygenic risk is uh, for developing a disease. Um, and so people are now showing, um, and this hasn't always been the case uh, during the GWAS era, but, but recently uh, you can construct polygenic risk scores um, among sets of individuals. Um, and find that among individuals that have, you know, the highest polygenic risk, um, they are more likely to go on and develop type 2 diabetes. And this has been shown in, in UK Biobank, for example. Um, whereas those that have lower uh, 
polygenic risk scores uh, tend to, 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 to not develop it or develop it later in life. Um, and so there, there's currently a lot of um, investigation going on into uh, leveraging genetic information to identify individuals at higher risk um, that may benefit from earlier intervention in terms of lifestyle modifications and, and interventions. Um, uh, whereas individuals that have maybe lower polygenic risk scores are, uh, you, you know, you might consider that as well. Um, where the tissue information might be useful is that uh, for, for you know, a disease like type 2 diabetes, there are different, you know, processes involved, right? You can have uh, the, you know, uh, maybe uh, more vulnerability to uh, impaired insulin secretion um, or a, a greater tendency to develop insulin resistance in peripheral tissues. And so if let's say we know which signals are um, more likely to act in the pancreas versus which signals are more likely to act in the liver, um, what we can do is not just construct uh, uh, overall genetic risk score, um, but a process specific genetic risk scores. So here is a, a risk score that, um, uh, that, that, that indicates um, you know, impaired eyelid activity versus uh, a risk score that indicates impaired liver activity. And you may find that among individuals that have higher polygenic risk for eyelid processes uh, are more likely to certain outcomes compared to individuals with, with more um, polygenic risk for peripheral tissues. Um, and this might have implications for which drugs they may be more recept responsive towards. Um, but again, this is all early days. Um, and so it, that, that's something that researchers are currently looking into to see if, um, uh, if, if, um, if, if you know, process-specific risk scores can help further um, predict um, outcomes. But that was a good question. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Jason. Um, so I have a, a little bit of a, a summary to add for that. So I think last summer um, we had a, a GDJC talk um, going over Mark and Anupa, as well as Jose Flores and Miriam's, uh, yeah. Miriam Udler's review paper on um, process specific and just overall genetic uh, risk scores. Um, and I recommend that read very much to be able to understand maybe the implications of some of what Jason's presented here, like looking at tissue specificity um, of various SNPs. Um, this is more of like a fundamental question from Juan Carlos. Um, so he was asking uh, like, how do de novo mutations, like mutations throughout the life course, um, yeah. maybe in influence genetic fine mapping? And I guess, are you making assumptions in doing these different analysis that these are not, you know, mutations throughout the life course, but inherited ones? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, that, that's a really good point. Uh, so, so yes, you know, there is a blind spot here towards de novo variants, um, which, which to my understanding, de novo polymorphisms aren't, aren't as, um, uh, aren't major contributors to the genetic architecture of type 2 diabetes, um, whereas they are consequential uh, for various forms of cancer. Um, so, so that's right. We aren't, you know, explicitly looking at de novo mutations, um, and and there's you know quite a lot of work that goes on into trying to predict the effect of of certain de novo mutations. And uh, I know there's there's a lot of deep learning analysis to try to predict the consequences of, of certain genetic perturbations in the genome on, on, on the consequences, um, downstream consequences. Um, but uh, to the latter part of the question, absolutely. There, there's certainly assumptions being made in fine mapping. Um, and these analyses were, were largely limited to single nucleotide polymorphisms. And so when you do this Bayesian analysis, there's this implicit assumption that you know, the causal SNP is one of these SNPs that you're looking at. Um, and again, the assumption is it's a SNP, um, but you know not all polymorphisms are SNPs, right? There are copy number variants. There are you know indels and um, you know a, a range insertions of insertions or deletions within. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, and and to some extent, um, uh, you know some indels can be tagged well by SNPs, um, and so even though you're not explicitly looking at an indel, uh, you you may you know see an association peak um, that's reflecting that signal. But in the fine mapping analysis, if you kind of just restrict it to the assumption that you know it's a SNP, then you're not going to miss that, or you're going to miss that. And I suspect, right, that uh, you know there, there might be something more complex going on among those you know 179 or so signals that are poorly fine mapped using the SNP data. 
Um, and so I, I do think that's a fair point, um, uh, which, which underscores the need to do um, further analysis and to integrate other data types. All right, thanks so much. I realize we're at time, um, but you summarized such a huge wealth and complexity of data and just wanted to thank you so much, Jason. Um, are you happy for our members to contact you if, you, if they have any follow-up questions? Uh, definitely. <laughs> All right, sounds no good. So Jason is a researcher at Oxford. If you have any um, questions about this presentation or want to keep up to date with his work, we've sent out an email that has his profile at Oxford where you can look at his updated publications. He also has a Twitter profile and we included his handle on our email as well.